And therefore tonight, as we look at this section from Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104, our text really will be focused upon that verse 102. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. And that's the title I'd like to give to our meditation tonight. It is quite simply taught of God. Taught of God. Every verse in this 13th part of the psalm begins with the Hebrew uh, letter Mem. And what it is impressing upon us is it's not enough to simply know the Word of God. It's not enough to be simply knowledgeable concerning the Word of God. We need something more. And we need to be taught by God. We live in a day and age when we are immersed in information and to some extent knowledge. We have many Bibles, probably too many Bibles, too many different versions of the Bible. And even in our own homes, although we might be ones who favour one particular version, we probably have multiple copies of that Bible in our homes. We have almost endless amount of commentaries available, either as hard copies or freely available to us on the internet. We have many, many Bible helps. We have uh, audio CDs, we have DVDs, and all of these things are filled by a large part, with good, sound, biblical material. And of course, we have a vast amount of resources that are freely available on the internet for us. Now, some of these things will be of questionable quality, but some of them will be first class. They will be truly biblical, and they will be well worth listening to and reading. But, The psalmist here in this section is impressing upon us that knowledge in of itself, or maybe more accurately, information in of itself, is not enough. We need to be taught of God. For that's what our text will tell us. I have not departed from thy judgments, meaning the word of God, his testimonies, his statutes, for thou hast taught me. And therefore all the things that we have, like our Bibles, our commentaries, and all our Bible helps, and all the resources that I mentioned, are good in their place. But ultimately the Christian is to be taught of God. He has to have a intimate knowledge of the Word of God that only God can give unto him. And really what this section is impressing upon us that to benefit from the word of God we need to be taught by God himself. We must be in good terms with the author if we are to learn from what he has written. The Holy Spirit has not inspired the word of God for our speculation He has inspired the word of God for us to be serious and to be earnest and to be diligent regarding the word of God. And head knowledge, academic knowledge, is not enough. We need something more. It must be put into practice. This is what the psalmist is impressing upon us here. That we will know the word of God only as we practice it only as we are obedient unto it. We all need what we might describe as heart knowledge of the Word of God. In other words, we are to know that the Word of God has changed our lives and does change our lives and continues to change our lives. I have not departed from thy judgments, He is walking in the way of God. He is walking according to the law of God. 
We know that many people might call this simply legalism, but it's not. It's heart religion. The psalmist is one who obeys God's word because he loves God and he shows it by obeying the word of God. Well, there's three things that I wish to draw from this portion of scripture for, I trust, our edification this evening. First of all, the believer must love his word and meditate on it. That is, the believer must love the word of God and meditate on it. He begins this section in verse uh, 97. Oh, how love I thy law. It is an exclamation. And that's, of course, is a sudden cry or a remark expressing surprise or strong emotion. He begins this section, Oh, how love I thy law. It is as if he is amazed at this fact that he has realized he loves the law of God. Now, we might not think that is not strange, but mo let's wait for a moment and think. This is remarkable. This is absolutely divine that this person is able to say, Oh, how love I thy law. Why is that so? Because this is not natural. It's not natural. We are Christians who always want to be able to see marks of grace. We are ones who will look at ourselves and examine ourselves. We should not be too keen to examine others. Instead, we should have a healthy respect to look into our own hearts and our own lives by the word of God and by his spirit and meditating upon his word. And if we are able to say with the psalmist, Oh, how love I thy law. If we can genuinely look in our hearts and say that we love the law of God, this is indeed a miracle. This is a work of grace. There's a well-known verse in Romans chapter 8, that wonderful chapter that begins with no condemnation and ends with no separation for the believer. But Paul says in verse 8 of that chapter, he's, he's talking about the, the carnal mind of, of the natural man, the mind that every single believer had before his conversion. And he says in verse 7 of chapter 8 of Romans, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. What's he saying in that verse? Well, he is telling us that the carnal mind, that is the natural mind, that's the mind that we're born with, is enmity against God. It is hostile towards God. It doesn't recognize God's authority in his word. It rebels against it, and it finds it offensive. For it, that is the mind, is not subject to the law of God. The natural man will never obey the law of God. Never. Never with his heart. He might grudgingly seek to obey it. He might recognize in a carnal sense that it is good for him to obey it, but there will be no love in it. It's through servile fear that he will do it. And it goes on to say, neither indeed can be. And there would Paul would remind us that the natural man needs to be converted. He needs to have a new heart. He needs to be changed inwardly. For, for in order for him to obey and to love the law of God, something must happen. A change must come upon him. Something from outside him must work in him. And here the psalmist, who we do believe is David, he exclaims to his surprisement, to his amazement, Oh, how love I thy law. He is acknowledging that something wonderful has happened to him. There was a time in his experience when this was not the case. 
but now he can honestly say that he loves the law of God. This is the work of the Spirit of God. This is not in of himself. This is nothing natural. This is supernatural. This is the mark of, of a child of God. This is a mark of the new birth. This is a mark that something glorious and wonderful and divine has indeed happened to the psalmist. And if we can enter into this experience, and if we can say of ourselves that we love the law of God, this is a wonderful mark of grace. You know, the devil knows the word of God. The devil is a, a first-class theologian. He's got degrees in theology. He's got all his theology perfect, far better than you and I. But he doesn't love it. Because that same word of God, that law of God, condemns him. And he knows that his time is short. Believer, no, all my hearers tonight, do you love the law of God? Oh, don't answer me. Answer yourself. Ask yourself that question. Can you say with the psalmist, honestly, answering yourself, your own conscience before God? Oh, how love I thy law. Well, it was for the psalmist, because he says, It is my meditation all the day. This again reminds us that you will meditate upon what you love. A husband will love his wife, and vice versa. Parents will love their children, and they will think about, upon them and upon the other ones that they love on occasions. We're not going to say that they will meditate upon them all day, but the people that they love and the things that they love and the activities that they love to some extent, they will think upon these things. If we are truly Christians, we will think and meditate and ponder and muse upon the Word of God. It is his meditation all the day. He thinks about it. That doesn't mean to say he does nothing else. Of course not. He will have his daily duties and his things that he has to do. But as he's doing them, he'll be thinking about the word of God. He will have a special time when maybe he will meditate particularly on it and do nothing else. But throughout the day, because he loves God's law, the law of God will work in him. It will permeate his whole being. It will submerge his thoughts. It will work out in his speech and in everything else. Because he loves the law of God. And of course, when he loves the word of God, the law of God, what is he revealing? He is revealing that he loves God. And of course, that is truly a work of grace because the natural man in of himself does not love God. He may well have a fear of God, but it's a fear of punishment. That's not the fear that the believer will have. The believer will have a fear of reverence. He will have a fear of adoration and of respect and of awe. And he will delight and love the Lord his God. And he will show that by loving his word. What is it goes on to say? Though, that, though through thy commandments has made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. That's not his enemies. His enemies are not with him all the time. Rather, his commandments, God's commandments, God's word is with him all the time. And even when his enemies are against him, he is able to learn from them. This man is always learning. Always learning. Because 
He is, in some sense, a walking Bible. Of course, we do believe here that the psalmist was David, and David was the king of Israel. And to be the king of Israel, it was required of him that he would have his own copy of the law of God. He would have a copy of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. That's all that were known to David at that time. And he would have a copy of that. Whether he carried that with him around him, it would be doubtful. But he would carry around in his mind. He would be storing up and memorizing verses and portions of the scripture because we are told for they are ever with me at the end of verse 98. There are many ways to learn. Many ways to learn the word of God. He speaks here about his enemies and he would, he would learn negatively from his enemies. He would see how his enemies behave. And of course, they would behave contrary to the word of God. And therefore, he would learn. He would look at their lives and look how they, they acted. And he would say to himself in a simplistic form, well, I'm not going to behave like them. These are my enemies and see what happens to them. No, I will do ex the exact, exact opposite. He was also going to learn from his teachers. I have more understanding than all my teachers. He was one who was prepared to learn from his teachers. But because he was obedient to the word of God and actually carried it out in practice, he went ahead of his teachers. Now that is not in any sense to be a slur on, their, on his teachers. It's a wonderful thing that if a pupil can excel his or her teacher. It shows the teacher has done a good job. The teacher has imparted knowledge and wisdom to the pupil and now the pupil goes on past, as it were, the teacher. That is commendable as far as the teacher is concerned. But David was one who was learning all the time, learning from his enemies, learning from his teachers, and then he goes on to say in verse 100, I understand more than the ancients. Who are the ancients? Well, the ancients are the, the old people in his day. As is normally the case, the elderly who have greater experience in life, they tend to know more. But David, the psalmist, because he was one who was taught of God, even excel the ancients. Why? Well, the verse tells us there, verse 100, because I keep thy precepts. You see, there's a direct link between obedience and knowing the word of God. It seems to be like this. As we are obedient, we know more of the word of God. And as we are more and more obedient, we get to know more and more concerning the Word of God. We're not here talking about simply knowledge. We're not simply talking about doctrines or, or historical facts and figures and that type of thing. No. David knows the Word of God in an experimental case. Matthew Henry says in his commentary, on this portion of scripture that we're looking at. Quote, By meditation we preach to ourselves, and so we come to understand more than our teachers. For we come to understand our own hearts, which they cannot. David was beginning to understand himself more and more. By meditating upon God's word, he was preaching to himself. And by meditation and thinking, he was coming to understand more about himself, more about his own heart. And as he continued to put in practice his obedience to the word of God, it had an ongoing effect. The more obedient he was, the more he knew. 
there's a direct link. And this is the ultimate way to be taught. That is to be taught of God. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. Isaiah talks about this. He talks about this in chapter 54 of Isaiah. And there he's prophesying better times for the people of God. And one of the things that will happen, he, he cites in that chapter 54 and verse 13 is, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. He's talking about better days for the, for the people of God, for the children of God. And he says, All thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. Let us ask ourselves then, have we been taught of God? We will come to it when we look at Second Timothy. But we know that Timothy was taught the scriptures from his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. For thou hast known the holy scriptures which are able to make thee wise unto salvation. And this is what it is to be taught of God. To be taught to be wise unto salvation. This is what David's talking about. Have we indeed been wise? Or have we been taught of God the great truths of salvation? Have we been taught of God in an ex experimental sense? the need to be saved? Has it been made clear unto us our great sinfulness and our great hopelessness and the fact that we are dead in trespasses and sins? This is something that God the Holy Spirit does. We must be taught of God of these things. The Holy Spirit, this is his great work. He will come, Jesus said. And he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. That is being taught of God. Do we know anything of that? We need to be taught these things. And yes, it is a duty of the preachers and the Sabbath school teacher. And it's a duty of parents to preach and to teach these things as far as their calling will allow them. But ultimately, these things must be taught of God. That's one reason why we read from John chapter 17, or John chapter 7, I should say, John chapter 7. There the Lord Jesus Christ went up to one of the feasts. His physical brethren were telling him, basically, if you want to be a public figure, you must go to Jerusalem and must make yourself known. But he said, I won't go. But when his brethren, his physical brethren left and they went to the feast, then Jesus did go up. And he began to teach and to preach and to speak. And those in authority, the religious leaders of the day, were amazed. Where did this man get learning? Where did this man get this teaching and Jesus, in verse 17 of John chapter 7, says, If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God, or whether I speak of myself. They were questioning him. He was talking about wonderful things. He was talking about the gospel. He was talking about his father. They were questioning him. If any man will do his will, that's the Father's will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. And there Jesus is clearly talking about obedience. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. If you do the will of God, you will know that I'm speaking the word of God. And then you will know that I have come from God. 
Of course, their problem was they were not obedient to the word of God. This is what he's teaching us here. I'm sure, like many of you, you try to fill your mind with the Word of God, and that's good. But you know the Word of God must work in us, and it must change our lives and our practice. We must work it out in our lives. He loved the Word and he meditated on it. Secondly, <clears throat> we must obey his word. A true student is one who has an obedient heart and loves to do God's will. This is what this is teaching us here. God's word is food for the soul. It's spiritual food. But it is not like a buffet where you pick and choose. We cannot go to God's word and just take and delight in the things that we like. Even as Christians, we can be picky and choosy. There are some Christians who do not like to hear the gospel being proclaimed forcefully. They don't like to hear what some would call fire and brimstone preaching. Well, there's a place for fire and brimstone preaching on occasions. It should not be the main diet in a minister's uh, preaching, but there will be occasions when it is necessary to be someone like John the Baptist. But some Christians are very, very fussy. And they don't like talking about sober, serious things. And they don't like to hear these things. They love rather to hear the wonderful and glorious promises in the Word of God. They like to hear about the consolations. They like to hear about the wonderful grace of God, His mercy, His compassion, which are wonderful and apt and appropriate titles to meditate upon. But there's a place for all. All the things that we find in the Word of God. All of these things have been revealed for us for a reason. David says here, Oh, how love I thy law. The law of God. And in the law of God there would have been many, many blessings proclaimed. But also, there would have been fearful curses in the Word of God, in the law of God. And those who were not obedient to God would find out what these curses would be. So the Word of God is not like a supermarket where we go along and choose what we want and leave aside what we don't want. We must love the whole of God's Word. And a true-hearted, genuine Christian will indeed appreciate when a very serious and solemn message is brought to their attention. It will be a warning to them. They will examine their self in the light of that warning. The Bible speaks about eternity. The Bible tells us clearly that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Every one of us has had a birthday, and unless the Lord Jesus Christ returns, we will have a day of death. We will have a day when we will be gathered to our fathers. We will go the way of all the earth. That day has been appointed. There's nothing you can do about it. God has decreed the day you were born and the day that you will die. Where will you go? The Christian can be assured he will go to heaven. He will face no condemnation. His sins have been forgiven. Christ has paid the price 
of his sins. Christ has kept the law of God on his behalf. Christ has suffered the penalty of the law of God on his behalf. He can look forward to the day of judgment and he will hear, Well done, good and faithful servant. But that's not going to be the case for all. Some will hear that terrible words, Depart from me. I never knew you. And where will they go? They will go to that place the Bible calls hell, where their worm will not die, and the fire it shall not be quenched. And although modern man, the natural man, and yes, sadly it has to be said, even professing Christians don't like to hear these things, that will not make them go away. God is not out to be popular. God is not a politician. God is not an entertainer. God is Almighty God, a holy and blessed and pure spirit who cannot tolerate sin, who will deal with it, and who has dealt with it on the cross, on his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But the day will come when he will deal not with sin, but with the sinner. Therefore, we are to love all God's word, not just what pleases us, but all of it. And if God's word is on some occasion solemn to us, let us take that warning. Let us examine ourselves. Oh, how love I thy law, all of it. The good parts, the pleasant parts, and the parts that would awaken us, would convict us, would, in some sense, terrify us. David loved them too. Because if he was strained, that would be a warning to him not to err, but to obey the Word of God. Well, thirdly and finally, we might notice, enjoy His Word. Enjoy His Word. I have not departed from thy judgments, for thou hast taught me. He doesn't depart from God's Word because... He meditates upon it. He gets great understanding. He's more understanding than his teachers and the ancients. He finds the word of God sweet to him. In verse 103, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Probably, honey would be the sweetest thing the psalmist could taste in his day. To him, the word of God. Yes, the promises. Yes, the consolations. But also the threatenings and the warnings and the rebukes and the judgments. All of them were sweet unto him. All of them. Everything that was contained in the word of God, he loved. It was sweeter to him than honey. I wonder what our reaction is to God's word. Can we say this? That we enjoy it? Even when we come to the house of God and our services are full of the word of God. They are regulated by the word of God. Do we enjoy God's word? David did. It was sweeter to him than honey. This word then. Why, why was it so enjoyable to him? Because he was taught of God. That's why. Why was he going to obey it? 
because he was taught of God. Why was he going to meditate upon it day and night? Because he was taught of God. It reminds us, friends, that in all our Christian profession, we need to be constantly taught of God. Here, the psalmist is acknowledging that he was taught of God to love it, to meditate upon it, to obey it, and to enjoy it. But the New Testament, we know that the disciples of Jesus came up to him and they said, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And this verse here, and what the disciples asked the Lord Jesus Christ, would remind us that in our Christian walk and in our Christian experience, we need to be taught of God. That's the great need of the day. Not to rely on secondary sources, Teachers are good. The older people who have greater experience are good. All our resources that we have are good. But ultimately, we need to be taught of God. That's what's required. And as a result, I have not departed from my judgments, for thou hast taught me. Amen. And may the Lord be pleased to bless his word to us. Let us pray together.